good evening to our DC audience and good morning and good afternoon to our international audience. I'm Jennifer Gordon and I'm the director of the Nuclear Energy Policy Initiative at the Atlantic Council Global Energy Center. Tonight we will be discussing the report, The Impact of Merging Climate and Trade Policy on Global Demand for Nuclear Energy, which was written by George David Banks. Dave Banks is a non-resident senior fellow with the Atlantic Council Global Energy Center, and he previously served as the chief strategist for the Republican side of the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. Dave has also served on the National Economic Council and the National Security Council at the White House, among many other roles. And I'm so delighted to introduce him to moderate this panel discussion. So without further ado, Dave, the floor is yours to introduce and moderate your panel. Thank you, Jennifer. It's, it's great to be here. Really appreciate the opportunity. Look, I mean, this, this is a really fascinating topic. It's actually fairly new in the sense that you haven't, you haven't had a lot of people dig into the climate and trade policy period. Um, it's largely been theoretical, but now you've got an increasing number of policymakers, not only here in the United States, but in Europe and elsewhere, looking at this policy and trying to figure out how is it going to work. But then also, you've got even fewer people who have looked at the intersection with nuclear energy and the potential role that nuclear energy could play uh, in a global decarbonization regime uh, that has, that's essentially defined by a new trade paradigm. So again, very happy that we brought together uh, such a great panel. Um, but before I turn it over to this wonderful group of folks, uh, and by the way, for folks in the audience, I gotta say this is a really cool setup here at Atlanta Council. So I would suggest that if you ever have the opportunity to come to Atlanta Council event, please come by. It's terrific. Uh, <clears throat> so, but yeah, so let me provide a little bit of a scene setter for folks uh, just to kind of answer the question, you know, why are we here? Why is it such an important issue? So first of all, and, and I always provide this context, I think it's really, really important for the audience to have a, an appreciation for the fact that U.S. economic and foreign policy making, uh, and maybe, maybe for the remainder of this century, is going to be increasingly shaped by the evolving geopolitical struggle uh, between the United States and China. Now, in practice, what does this mean? Well, it means that Democrats and Republicans are going to be looking at how do you use industrial security policy to be able to check Chinese influence and power in the global economy and how to reduce the risk of U.S. dependence on China and, those type, on the, and the supply chains that are under Chinese control. So economic nationalism is almost a return to, uh, what would it be, pre-World War II or pre-World War I U.S. economic policy making. It was a return to economic nationalism uh, as an emerging factor or an, and, and, and very influential factor in U.S. policy making. And there's a lot of interest in exploring you know, how do you merge industrial policy, trade, energy, and environment climate policy in a way that produces a U.S. competitive advantage in global markets? So take carbon, for example. Uh, a lot of people don't have an appreciation for this because I get asked this question, why is the United States such a laggard when it comes to climate policy? Uh, but in reality, the United States has led the world in absolute emissions reduction since 2005 by far, and the United States and I would add, to, together with our uh, treaty allies and partners, are amongst the cleanest economies in the world when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions. China, in contrast, is more than three times more carbon intensive than America. Russia is more than four times. So there's a growing desire to explore what we do so well here in the United States. We may not talk about it that much, but what we do so well here in the United States when it comes to emissions performance <clears throat> and create a new trade paradigm that actually rewards American companies for that performance. And I would argue that if this is done in conjunction with our treaty allies, it's also going to reward their companies. Now, right now, I would, point, I would make the argument uh, that the current trade regime does not do that, right? The, the current trade regime rewards countries for their poor environmental and labor records. So I think that probably there's, there's broad agreement with the people on the other side who are the audience and, and, and here in the room, but that's, that's, a, that's a, uh, a situation that would be very good for us to work to change. But let's be clear, um, there's a right way and there's a wrong way for doing this. The right way would help return U.S. supply chains 
or key components of the supply chain back to our shores. It would help bolster U.S. manufacturing. It would increase investments in domestic manufacturing. And it would also be a geopolitical tool that the United States could use and, and help check Chinese influence in the global system. But if we do it the wrong way, it's potentially detrimental, and I would argue it is detrimental to U.S. national interest, okay? Because it would essentially create a wedge between the United States and U.S. partners and allies and other countries. So we want to avoid that as much as possible. So, again, lucky to, great, to have a great panel today, and we're joined by some of the premier experts on this issue. And I've had the pleasure of working with this wonderful group of folks uh, off and on for, you know, at least the last few years. And in the case of Aaron, he and I date back a good 10 years or so. So let me introduce the, the panelists quickly. Uh, first, we have Michael Mailing. He's Deputy Director of the MIT Center for Energy and Environmental Policy Research. He focuses on international climate policy design and implementation, including its intersections with trade, with energy. Um, he's been an advisor to a number of governments. Uh, you've advised the U.S., you've advised the EU and the U.K., maybe a few others. So again, uh, Michael is definitely in the, in, the, in the middle of this international conversation. Uh, in addition, we're joined by Matt Porterfield, who's Vice President for Policy and Research at the Climate Leadership Council. He's also a part-time adjunct professor at Georgetown. Uh, he works on various aspects of international economic law with a particular focus on the relationship between international trade and investment rules and environmental policy. We've also got my friend Sarah Stewart here. Smile for folks, Sarah. <laughs> there you go. She's the executive director at Silverado Policy Accelerator. She's got nearly two, tech, two decades of experience when it comes to trade negotiations, trade policy. Uh, prior to Silverado, you handled trade policy for Amazon. Did you enjoy that job? No, because you went to Silverado. I'm, te I'm teasing, I'm teasing you, I'm teasing. Um, for five years, for five years, she was at the U.S. Trade Representative where she led environmental negotiations with, the, uh, <coughs> with Mexico, with uh, Canada, with EU. So again, uh, you, she's got a lot of hands-on uh, experience when it comes to implementing this type of policy, okay? And then lastly, we're joined by uh, Aaron Weston, who serves as the leader for nuclear safeguards, security, and nonproliferation strategies at Idaho National Lab. Prior to that, he served uh, as nuclear director for the National Economic and Security Councils. He actually worked with me for a bit, um, and hopefully he will admit that um, uh, in public, um, maybe not, but prior to that experience, he worked <laughs> on the House Science Committee where he was lead counsel for nuclear energy matters. So as a matter of process, we're gonna talk for maybe 30, 40 minutes. We wanna have an open exchange. We wanna have a good conversation up here. I think that folks listening in are probably would, would probably find that a lot more interesting. I know that we would, okay, we're, you know, we don't want to just hear each other's talking points. Uh, and then we'll see if we've got time for Q's and A's from the audience. So uh, first round of questions. Let's keep it, you know, three to five minutes, you know, max. And we'll sort of take the scene setter that I kind of <clears throat> laid out and dig deeper into that. And then we'll have a second round of questions with shorter responses. But so, Michael, let's start with you. You've got a lot of experience on this. You've been working on this longer than, I think probably longer than the rest of us have. Maybe I'm wrong there. Um, but I think, you know, I think what's really interesting is that you've got, you have growing momentum in this policy space, right? You've got a lot of, you've got a lot of uh, capital going into how does this work? How can we implement this? So can you give us a broad overview on on uh, where we are with this conversation today internationally, okay, and how do we get here? Mm -hmm. All right, no, thanks, Dave. Um, it's great to be with you here and with the panelists, and I agree, it's a great <coughs> setup here at the Atlantic Council. Um, so you're sort of asking, you know, how do we get here? What's the history of this discussion of, of trying to merge trade and, and environmental or climate policy, and where are we standing right now? And, I'd sort of point out that, and I'll focus on one specific instrument, although 
that intersection of trade and climate can take many additional forms, but this is perhaps the most visible one, border adjustments. Um, a border adjustment is essentially, simply put, you know, the extension of a domestic charge or policy requirement, not only imposed on domestic produced goods, but also imported goods that are consumed domestically. <clears throat> so you level the playing field. And border adjustments have been around for centuries. It makes sense if you think, you know, I don't know, liquor taxes in the past. <clears throat> you had bourbon in your own state and you tax it, you have a liquor tax in that way. You don't want to give an artificial advantage to imported scotch by not including it in the liquor tax. Same with fuels. Why benefit imported Saudi oil if you're taxing your Texan oil? You'll apply the same charge. So it's essentially you tax it where it's consumed. That's the destination principle. Now, we didn't have that, of course, be, become relevant in an environmental context until we started seeing use of fiscal or market-based instruments for environmental policy. In the 90s, some European nations started you know, introducing um, carbon and environmental taxes, and then you started having that discussion, but wait a minute, aren't we disadvantaging our domestic producers if we charge domestic products a certain tax, but we don't apply that to imports? So same thought, you, know, you wanna kind of level the playing field there. Climate policy, of course, been a bit slower coming, but in the 2000s, as European governments, but also in the US, started having a discussion about what policies do we want to use? And of course, you know, economists have been recommending market-based policies. Then you have the same question. If you introduce a cost for your domestic producers, don't you want to level that? So in the mid-2000s, we had that pop up both here in North America and in Europe, several proposals. They never got enough traction to be implemented, really. California has sort of a unique thing in its California cap and trade system, but that's the rare exception. <clears throat> it wasn't until the late teens, if you like, so really only a few <clears throat> years ago, that you see this acceleration of a climate policy ambition that heightens these concerns about you know, level playing field, competitive disadvantages, you start seeing a little bit more aggressive or confrontational trade tactics and trade policy using tariffs against trade partners, you know, to, again, for various reasons. But, you know, so th there's a change kind of in the, in the attitudes in trade policy as well and in trade relations. Um, and, you know, finally, I, I, I think those are probably the two main things. Some would also argue that, and we have a Paris Agreement, so we don't have to worry that we're going to antagonize the international community by using these unilateral policies. So, Again, in Europe, we have this discussion around a CBAM. There's been a legislative proposal that was released last year. It's going through the political, the sort of interinstitutional dialogue between the Parliament and the Council of the European Union. And we expect to see that probably enter into force sometime later this year or early next year. So they're really sort of far ahead with this. In the US, we've had a number of bills. We've seen a resolution in the House of Representatives. Um, you know, it's been included in the Biden sort of climate plan. So there's every expectation that this keeps coming back because there's pressure for it. It, it, it resonates well with industry, with many other constituencies, labor unions, et cetera. Um, and frankly, I think it's, it's proven in what we've seen so far already, a very powerful tool to leverage the market power <clears throat> 500 million consumers in Europe, 350 million in the US, um, in sort of coaxing and incentivizing trade partners around the world, like in China, et cetera, to, to up their climate policy game. So that's roughly where we stand. I mean, still a lot to happen, but I think the momentum is there and it's accelerating. And I, I, I think there's no doubt that we will see more and more of, uh, use of trade policies in this field. Well, I totally, totally agree with you. And I, and I think that from a Republican perspective, uh, what I find really interesting is how so to, to, your, to your point, this idea has been thrown around for quite a while. It didn't really pick up traction until after Paris <laughs> and then after, you know, trade, let's call it tariff diplomacy emerged as a, as a U.S. policy, uh, for example. Uh, but what I, think is, what I think is interesting from a, that Republican perspective is that it's taken a geopolitical sort of tone, right? It's, it's, become, it's become really a foreign economic policy design uh, to maybe uh, to undo some of the some of the uh, advantage that I think that people feel like, feel that we transferred over to China, for example, and so and this is why I think that this I totally agree it's got legs and I really believe it has legs uh, because again it's wrapped up in foreign economic policy as well. No, thank you. So Matt, um, no, Matt, yes. So Climate Leadership Council. You guys have done uh, a lot of terrific work in this space on the U.S. carbon advantage. You've been thought leaders. Uh, you've had a big impact on, certainly on the conversation uh, here in Washington, okay, and particularly up on Capitol Hill. So could, could you highlight and give an overview of, of your research and findings at CLC? Uh, 
Sure, and I, I think you both laid a, a nice foundation for this. You noted in your opening remarks that U.S. manufacturing is relatively uh, carbon efficient compared with our global competitors. Uh, uh, products made in the United States are about 40% less carbon intensive <coughs> than the global average, uh, or about a third the carbon intensity of products made in China, one of our major sources for imported products. Uh, and that's largely because of the availability of uh, relatively um, accessible, renewable, low carbon e energy, uh, but also because of the particular uh, technologies and production processes that we use in our manufacturing. So take steel, for example. Uh, steel in the United States is some of the cleanest production in the world. And that's largely because it's, it's made here mostly in uh, relatively efficient electric arc furnaces with a much higher percentage of recycled scrap uh, than in, in many of our competitors. Uh, some of our global competitors are still manufacturing in coal-fired blast furnaces that have uh, up to seven times the carbon intensity of U.S. produced steel. So that presents a real, uh, a, a real competitive opportunity for the United States, and it's what we're calling the American carbon advantage. If you're able to take what was an environmental externality, the, the associated greenhouse gas emissions, and attach a price to that, and if you attach it both to uh, domestic production and to imports through uh, border adjustments, as, as Michael explained, uh, you force them to internalize the cost of what was an environmental externality. And if you're the, the relatively low carbon producer, that can give you a real market advantage. So we looked at uh, steel and found that if we were to apply a uniform price to both domestic and imported steel, we would cut imports by about 50%. Uh, we would increase domestic production by about 10%, uh, and we would increase the profitability of the domestic industry by up to about 40%. And you could get similar results in other energy-intensive trade-exposed industries if you have a, a, a comparable carbon advantage. And we've, we've referred to this as the American carbon advantage, but really with comprehensive carbon pricing, it doesn't matter so much who's imposing the policy if it's applied to both imports um, and domestic production, the clean producer is going to win. For example, under the CBAM that Michael was just discussing, it is projected that U.S. is actually going to increase its exports um, from uh, steel and some other energy intensive products to Europe. Why? Yes, we will be subject to the carbon price, but we're going to be competing against other dirtier producers who are also subject to the price. So uh, as you, you indicated these sort of policies are getting more traction and are being adopted in more jurisdictions. As you start to get a broader and broader number of countries who are uh, imposing some sort of price on, on carbon, uh, you're going to get competitive advantage for uh, low uh, carbon intensity producers regardless of, of uh, where they're located. Uh, that can happen in a sort of ad hoc manner that seems to be developing now, or it could happen in a more coordinated way through some sort of carbon club arrangement. And that's another idea that's been getting a lot of attention uh, lately. Fairly light on the details, but uh, in general, the idea is that you could get a group of countries who would agree upon some shared standards for imposing a carbon price, you know, maybe a common external border adjustment, um, and then the potential to expend uh, to not impose the uh, the border adjustments within members of the club. But there's a lot to be worked out there. But I, I think that presents a lot of opportunities. That's terrific, and I really I really think the the concept of the club mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> is fascinating. I'm sure a lot of our audience, particularly those uh, overseas, internationally, mm -hmm. uh, have a lot of interest in it as well. So let's, so let's spend some time on that piece. Sarah, let's go over to you, because uh, you've been tracking the, uh, the uh, negotiations between the U.S. and the EU on steel and aluminum. Okay, and, so I, th and I think that that announcement, well, I guess it was late last year, took a lot of people by surprise, right? And I think that there's a lot of interest. Now, we all know that, you know, your former employee, employer, USTR, is kind of a black box when it comes to knowing what's going on. But uh, how, do you, how do you see those talks going? And what, and what do you, um, what kind of potential do you see? And going, going back to some of Matt's comments and sort of expanding US-EU cooperation on this concept of a carbon club and international climate and trade in general. 
Yeah, well, um, I have a lot to say on that, but I'll keep my remarks to three to five minutes. <laughs> um, so, well, first of all, thank you so much, Dave, and congratulations on your excellent report. I hope everybody has an opportunity to, to read it because it really is on, on the cutting edge and there are a few people who are more expert in this than, than you. Um, also, thanks to the Atlantic Council. Um, and thanks for putting uh, the only female on the panel on such a large screen so that uh, you know every aspect of my face can be scrutinized. Um, Thank you, Sarah. Well, <laughs> you're very welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, well, look, Dave, you're 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 exactly right. Um, I I spent quite a bit of time when I was at USTR uh, working on the TTIP negotiation with the EU. Uh, one thing I know for sure when it comes to, to the U.S.-EU relationship is that everybody always underestimates how hard it will be to reach an agreement, even though we are extremely like-minded partners and, and key allies. Um, just look at recent uh, events uh, with the Inflation Reduction Act discussion, uh, which has created the latest stir uh, among the U.S. and the EU. But... I have a lot of optimism here, uh, and I do think that this trade and climate space may be the one area where we can see some real breakthroughs, not just with the US and the EU, but hopefully with, within the broader uh, community. I think the US and the EU really both understand the gravity of acting decisively and urgently when we're talking about trade and climate. And you know, I hope that that translates to uh, a pragmatic uh, and uh, a pragmatic agreement on steel and aluminum, uh, and that can be scaled to other partners and also to to other other products. Just today, probably many of you in the audience have been following the U.S. and the EU had a meeting of the um, Trade and Technology Council, and. The joint statement that came out of that uh, meeting is pretty clear. Uh, they launched a new transatlantic initiative for sustainable trade. Um, it's going to be looking at how we can work together to incentivize decarbonization, uh, including through the facilitation uh, of <clears throat> trading and services that are essential to the transition uh, to more circular and net zero economies. So I think, you know, this is really apropos for tonight's discussion, uh, as well as, you know, where things are headed with the US EU steel and aluminum discussions, otherwise known as the global arrangement, which I think is part of this broader um, uh, uh, suite of cooperation that the US and the EU are pursuing on, on trade and climate. Um, I wanted to raise just a couple of, of points on the US-EU uh, negotiations. Um, I'm certainly not going to uh, speak for, for either government and, and a lot of those negotiations have been close hold, but I do think that you know, a lot of people in the you know, broader community that are stakeholders and you know, current and, and, and former government officials are really taking a careful look at what form this type of agreement could take. Uh, Matt alluded to uh, CBAMs and to carbon clubs. I think that you know the the majority of people who are watching these developments do believe that something along those lines is in the cards here. I think there's two really important issues that I would call out um, that will be areas to really watch here. The first is the methodology for counting the embedded emissions in traded steel and aluminum, and frankly, in, in other products, because of course, com companies have been doing this for years. Many countries have mandated all sorts of reporting systems, but nobody has really looked at this for purposes of trade. Mm -hmm. And so I think that is something that is going to be in a very highly technical area um, where industry participation and experts from across a range of agencies and subject matter experts really need to be weighing in so that we can get that right. 
The second, the second key area that I would that I would raise here is, you know, even if the U.S. and the EU are able to reach an agreement, how can that agreement be structured to allow for it to be scaled to other products and to other and to other countries, and how can it include? complements. Mm. So for example, <clears throat> if this ended up being a carbon club where the US and the EU agreed that they would not um, you know, impose carbon tariffs on one another, um, could there also be a carrot element that works its way into this agreement where there's actually lower tariffs on environmental goods and technologies, including the type that would encourage more nuclear production or you know, other forms of, of clean technologies. So I think that you know the jury's still out on exactly what form it will take, but there's there's a lot at play. I know the discussions are underway, and you know hopefully those in the audience that you know have a stake in this are are, are able to speak up so that we can get this right. So you got to get the math right. That's the most important thing, right? Mm -hmm. It's the math. Yep. So just from from um, so Michael and and Matt. I, so let's talk about the. Carbon Club, just a little bit. Um, so, which one of you? I mean, what are your thoughts on the likelihood of being able to pull something like that together? Because I think, as Sarah suggested, this is not going to be easy. It's complex, right? And then, uh, if you want to talk a little bit about, you know, what you think is the most likely policy design or kind of how you do it, you know, we don't have to get into a tremendous amount of detail, <coughs> obviously, but just to kind of give the I guess what I'm really trying to get at is how likely do you see the formation of a carbon club and how big is it? You know, it's because I think we can all, all agree that it's not going to be a global agreement. So let's start with you first, Michael. Sure. Thanks, Dave. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I feel it's a glass half full, glass half empty, half empty thing. And it, Matt already alluded to the fact that there can be varying degrees of intensity of cooperation in such a club. I mean, frankly, we have a climate club. The G7 came up with a statement on climate club at the end of its um, summit this June um, in, in Germany. Uh, but it's very vague, very superficial. Yeah. And it excluded certain things, for instance, border <clears throat> carbon adjustments. And frankly, my experience working, I mean, I've, I've followed and sort of participated in discussions around carbon pricing for longer than I care to think, 15 plus years. It's really hard to kind of overcome certain specificities of the context, the political context, the legal, institutional, economic context you're operating in, and sort of come to common agreement on some of these policy elements. So for instance, I'm not so confident that we would have a club in which everybody agrees to the same border carbon adjustment. At the same time, I fully agree, there is a lot of energy to cooperate on this. And I think all jurisdictions <coughs> in question here are very aware that you want to avoid having a, a you know, landscape with a patchwork of methodologies and procedures that just introduce tremendous new transaction costs for international trade. So what I could see, and where I'm much more optimistic, is that things such as the global arrangement, the G7 club, etc., do go some <coughs> ways in sort of agreeing on either common methodologies, standards, and procedures, or at least agreeing that it's okay to have slightly different uh, approaches, but will We'll accept those, you know, ISO, greenhouse gas protocol, European EUETS monitoring, reporting, you know, as long as it's not like you only impose one specific thing, each jurisdiction has its own approach, and then it becomes a patchwork and it makes things very unmanageable. So I'm hopeful that, you know, they'll, they'll actually go beyond that, but at least that's what I see happening at a minimum. Whether or not it can go beyond <coughs> that depends a lot on the politics, and as you know, those tend to always be fickle, and we have agreements, uh, disagreements even between close trading partners across the Atlantic. Matt? Uh, yeah, I, I think I'm pretty much on the same page with Michael. I, I don't think there's going to be a carbon club that starts as a large plurilateral negotiation and uh, the participating members all agree to structure their domestic climate policy in a certain manner to conform to the requirements of the club. I think it's going to come out of existing conflict and existing uh, domestic initiatives. So the, you know, the, the, the two big developments in the last couple of years are the development of the CBAM which is going to roll out any time now. Uh, the CPAM includes its own germ of a club. If you have domestic carbon, um, explicit domestic carbon pricing, then you're going to be exempt from charges under the CBAM. Um, if you don't, like the United States, then under at least what we know the proposal so far, uh, you're not. So that's going to um, 
that's going to be one potential model for participation. And you know, it, it folds in the EFTA also, so it's already sort of a club lake arrangement. And then you have uh, the, global, the global arrangement. Um, that's sort of a club. It's an agreement between uh, you know, something approaching countries comprising almost half of global GDP. Um, it's sector specific. Uh, and it's not clear what the mechanism, the nature of the border charge. And you've got asymmetries where the EU does have a domestic price and it's implementing its own border charge regime. And uh, the US currently has neither. Uh, they've got to work that out somehow. Um, many other countries have expressed interest in participating in that arrangement, the UK, Japan. Um, uh, so I, I think that that's how a club is going to evolve. It's going to evolve from the sort of uh, kernel of domestic policy and conflicts over those domestic climate policies. Uh, I think G7 level is, an, is a next logical scope of expansion. You know, Canada is probably going to be developing its own border club regime. It would make sense, you know, largely integrated supply chains. It would make sense to get them involved. I see less prospect for the G7 itself to be the sort of cradle right. of a club. I mean, the, the G7 doesn't have a whole lot of uh, institutional capacity to do something like that. Um, but I, I, I think uh, members of the G7 would be uh, probably on the short list of who should be involved in the negotiations that are, that are already starting with the U.S. and the EU. And beyond border charges, we now have this, this fight over uh, climate link subsidies under the IRA. Uh, the EU's hands are not clean in that regard either. Uh, unfortunately, all these negotiations are happening in separate processes. So, right. uh, so, you know, there's one process for the global arrangement discussions, another process for the IRA discussions. Uh, I, I think there's the potential to pull those together, though, because they, they do bleed over into one another to a certain extent. And, and that's really where I, I, I see the most potential for a club. Well, I, yes, and I agree with that. And I think that that is, that's probably an area of diplomacy mm -hmm. <clears throat> that we need to give special attention to, because to your point, Supply chain security mm -hmm. is certainly linked with the whole sort of right. climate and trade agenda. And we, and we really, to, to get the math right, to, to try to, to figure out, as, you, as you're pointing out, it's not easy. It's probably going to be different layers yeah. right before it, and it'll keep evolving, right? right? But, and, I would, and I think that I, would, I might plug G7 Plus, mm -hmm. right, to include Australia and South Korea as right. well. Uh, but yeah, so we do need to have a much more comprehensive approach on the concept and how to, and what do we need to do to, in order to pull that off, mm -hmm. right? Because I think that we all agree that uh, if you don't have a club, if you don't have a critical mass of the global economy adopting this type of approach, then you're not going to be able to address global emissions, uh, particularly just across supply chains the way we need to right. in a way that's consistent with the science. Right. And that it's also consistent with, from, a, from an American perspective, consistent with US geopolitical goals, right? It needs to be much more comprehensive. Uh, but so but this brings me to Aaron, because uh, we are, we're kind of, we've brought up, we brought up, and I think Sarah brought up the, brought up, she, you brought up nuclear, but clearly uh, there's going to be if this becomes a G7 plus type of agreement, even though it may be layered, you know, you may have different progress and with different pieces, right? Um, you know, and I think that it, it might be uh, it might be likely that you could have other countries participate in it as well, even if it's not kind of a formal government relationship. It might be just through their companies, okay? Uh, but this will obviously have an impact on the global energy mix, because I think Matt made this point about uh, when he's talking about the carbon advantage and the carbon intensity of different economies, a big chunk of that's coming from the power sector, mm -hmm. right? How much coal you got on the grid versus natural gas versus nuclear. And so one of the big questions that we've, that you, that we've discussed, you and I have discussed, and the paper kind of gets into this as well, is what's the impact going to be on global demand for commercial nuclear energy? Right, because people aren't sort of people aren't thinking through. Again, they've just started thinking about the trade policy piece with climate, and they haven't really thought through what this could potentially mean for nuclear energy. So, tell us what tell us how you see this playing out. You had you had the Dow announcement with uh, X Energy, so you definitely have movement within U.S. industry to pair up with nuclear. But please go ahead. Sure. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, I don't track the um, 
global trade regimes uh, the way that you do, and I, I, I should shame on you. Shame right? On yeah. You. Well, you know, um, there's only so many hours in the day, I guess. Um, <laughs> or maybe I, maybe since I've uh, uh, you know moved to Idaho, I just uh, enjoy life a little bit more. Well, you're the there. nuclear <laughs> engineer of the group. Sure. Um, so, yeah. I mean, there's no doubt that uh, what you're describing um, creates some sort of economic incentive to invest in more nuclear energy. I mean, nuclear is great because it works anywhere and all the time. Um, you know, how uh, the um, kind of carbon club, as you all have talked about, would be implemented, you know, is something that I don't fully understand. M maybe no one can say definitively. But if there's any form of a tax that's somehow um, being levied on the, you know, carbon profile or carbon uh, emissions footprint of goods that are changing borders, um, clearly the manufacturers of those goods are going to want to lower that uh, carbon profile or carbon footprint or whatever they're calling it. Um, and then so their operations, they're going to look to how they can, you know, uh, optimize the production of their product. And, um, you know, what's great about nuclear, like I said, is you can, you can do it anywhere. You can, you can, uh, you can operate at any scale or size. Um, and so um, in many cases, uh, the, 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 the uh, produced goods are, you know, using industrial heat. Um, and, um, you know, actually, you know, many people forget, but primarily, you know, nuclear energy is a heat source. And then, it, you know, that heat is then applied to, uh, to turbo machinery to generate electricity. So um, where industrial heat is, um, if that's being evaluated um, and the associated carbon emissions, then, you know, a nuclear source presumably would get a score of zero. Um, you know, I don't know how such a uh, international regime would be implemented, but... You know, under those circumstances, it would make perfect sense that um, industrial scale manufacturers that are using significant industrial heat would, would certainly look to nuclear energy. I think, um, you know, one of the questions, though, too, is whether the law, uh, rules, and regs um, uh, accurately match the true risk. Um, you know, these are things that, um, you know, still are really quite old. Um, for, the, for the established nuclear economies, I mean, they set up their regulatory regimes many, many decades ago, and under different circumstances, and really with different, um, uh, I think, a uh, different philosophy in mind. Certainly, they weren't thinking about, um, you know, really ramping up nuclear energy to be applied across the board for so many things. I mean, nuclear has traditionally been used for very large power plants to uh, put electricity on the grid. And I think also, from what you're describing, there, you should see significant investment in that, too, probably just depending on how high this tax is, too, and how much that affects... Um, uh, the um, the electricity demand for the for the for the producers of goods that are being taxed, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that might be unique too to each uh, economy that's a part of this this club that everyone's described. Um, but uh, I, I would say probably the manufacturers are the ones I would look to first. Those who are going to be affected the most by the proposed uh, tariff or, or or whatever the um, you know uh, sort of tax mechanism is going to be. Um, uh, so I guess, you know, I would probably want to see, know more about um, the, the implementation of the proposed club, um, but under any circumstance, you should see more enthusiasm, investment, and then hopefully innovation in the, pro in the nuclear designs to um, diminish those carbon profiles for um, goods that are exchanging borders. That's great. And, we're, and look, I mean, we obviously will have people who would remind us, well, what about renewables, if it all, if it this type of regime would increase demand for renewables as well, which sure. is probably reliable. Under many of the circumstances I'm aware of. Um, and yeah, so, so they could only handle the electricity piece and that right. wouldn't be 24 seven. As you've kind of, yeah. again, like I say, I, I, I'm not the um, expert on international trade and um, international law here. Um, but as I kind of understand the, the Carbon Club concept is that um, you're talking about some sort of a tariff that values the carbon profile associated with goods that are chain, uh, crossing borders. And so it's just the good that's being taxed. Um, so yes, if, if the manufacturer of the good is, is going to be able to lower their, and they're, and they're consuming a lot of electricity, that, that would also be a great incentive for renewable energy as well. Um, although it wouldn't work all the time. I mean, um, so that, that, that could be an issue for them. Just probably just depends on sort of what's available um, to those manufacturers wherever they're located. Um, but like certainly in the case of heat, uh, embedded heat, where that's a big part of their manufacturing process, and if that is being scrutinized as part of the carbon profile for the, the, the end point widget or whatever that's being sold, then I think you would see 
more interest in nuclear energy. Um, again, too, like how high is the tax? What is that? How, how does that affect the sort of the other competitive, um, you know, the, 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 you know, their their competitiveness against their, the um, the others who are selling that that good? You know, those are things I just don't know. But just thinking within the bounds of the laws of physics, nuclear energy is definitely going to be more viable to provide a solution to to this uh, to this challenge. Uh, thank you. And and a quick question here. Uh, you don't have to have a a detailed response to it, but uh, so because we're talking about we're talking about a new trade paradigm, but as part of that, if it has if it has uh, an effect or if it influences the demand for nuclear energy for global demand, then the question is, do we need a new paradigm for international trade and civil technology and services, right? Uh, from a U.S. perspective in particular? I don't know if you've got thoughts on Yeah, that. I, I think sure so. Have. I mean, like, you know, I guess it's that's sort of like you kind of write a book on all of what that could be. But um, just, again, simply, you know, where I see one of, the, one of the mismatches here, which can really stifle the investment innovation in nuclear energy, is that the law does not really appropriate, uh, and, the, and the rules and the regs don't appropriately match, match the actual risk that you're trying to mitigate. So, you know, for nuclear energy, you really want to minimate, uh, uh, mitigate risk to... Um, public safety and health, and also risk to proliferation. But uh, so many of these um, uh, uh, you know, rules and, 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 and laws are, they date way back you know, to when the world looked a lot different. And I think that those- Well, when the US had a monopoly. Yeah, or close to a monopoly. Or, and, yeah. and really a mindset too of you know, exports, maybe nuclear exports, actual nuclear technology, sort of being almost a last resort. So it wasn't really something they were trying to you know, maybe encourage, and then now it might, that might look a lot different. But then here too, I think we're also talking about the increase in investment for nuclear energy where they're already probably have nuclear energy, but they want to protect their manufacturing base. So these are those com uh, countries who are the, the manufacturers and exporters of goods. Um, and some of them may not have nuclear energy yet. So that would be, you know, a si situation maybe they want to build nuclear energy to protect a, a manufacturing base that exists, but many of those already do have, but they want to increase that. So presumably that sh they already have some apparatus to regulate it. But more likely than not, it's not something that's probably trying to encourage novel uses of this uh, energy source. So I think that's something that will probably need to change. Um, Aaron, you haven't talked about the national security issues with China getting a monopoly since we're since we've talked about China in this context of trade. So 30 seconds on that. Sure. I mean, I guess, you know, for that, you're just, again, I think looking simply at a competitive advantage is the best way to say it. So if, 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 these, um, if the United States and its allies are imposing rules upon themselves that make them um, not able to compete uh, with uh, Chinese exports of manufactured goods that are coming from nuclear electricity or heat or the actual exports of nuclear energy, certainly you're going to see China exploit that advantage. And that's probably... It's most certainly going to be a problem for the United States if you see more and more Chinese reactors built around the world and China um, gaining more leverage in those countries. Um, if, they're, if they are the sole provider of nuclear energy to some emerging uh, nuclear energy country and then have a 100-year fuel contract with them, well, that really doesn't look very good for our geopolitical positioning yes. with those countries. So, and if you have this new trade paradigm that, res that results in maybe some type of de facto international price on carbon, that then drives global demand, increases global demand for nuclear. Do we want to see that market to China, that growing market to China? And you know, what kind of what kind of changes do we need to have to U.S. international law, et cetera, when it comes to civil nuclear? So, of energy? course, my answer is no. We don't want to see <clears throat> that advantage to China. Um, and I think principally, the United States. Um, <clears throat> Probably we have two limiting factors that are putting us at a disadvantage. One, we don't produce enough fuel. Um, uh, one of the key uh, areas here is if you want to export uh, nuclear energy technology to a, uh, another country, you really want to be confident that you can provide them with a reliable fuel source. Because generally, it's been an established principle that um, we want to see um, we do not want to see the spread of enrichment and reprocessing technology around the world. Uh, we want to be that fuel provider. So that means we need to increase our own fuel production. And then two, um, we need to be more proactive in engaging with those who uh, can benefit from this. So if on the one hand, we'd like to see global decarbonization, that means that all countries around the world need to diminish their uh, emissions profiles from their electricity sectors. And so for those where it makes sense to get nuclear energy, um, I think the United States would benefit from national security perspective by being proactive with those countries to provide them an option. 
an option of U.S. nuclear energy, or hopefully our allies would be doing the same. Uh, thank you. So while we're on the topic of international law, Matt, <clears throat> so you've given, you've obviously given this uh, a lot of thought about, you know, the compatibility of a climate trade regime with international trade law, but particularly uh, as it pertains to WTO. And, I'm, and I know that Sarah's given it some thought too. So, <laughs> but why don't you, why don't you share your thoughts and we'll get your thoughts quickly, Sarah, and then we'll. And then we'll wrap, we'll wrap up, I think, the conversation probably with you. And then if we have any Q&As out in the audience, we can, we can kind of, we can fill those as well. So please. Uh, so I'll, I'll give a good lawyerly answer and say it, it depends. I mean, the, uh, the, the types of policy. No, the right lawyer answer is that, of course, the United States <laughs> is always correct in any kind of law that it implements. Yeah. Well, the, uh, particularly in, in discussions of carbon clubs, it, it's, it's been a, uh, the term's been used to cover a wide range of models, and um, and even the discussion of border adjustments now is is uh, suffering from sort of similar concept creep. So, at one end, you have what what Michael described earlier, which is the classic carbon tax based upon uh, rules which were drafted back in the '40s to accommodate the widespread practice of countries of uh, permitting border adjustment on consumption taxes. So if you want a WTO compliant model, mm. uh, have an economy-wide uh, carbon tax and border adjusted on imports and exports, and, uh, and that is consistent with the basic structure of, of the trade rules. You won't need any sort of exotic theory or exceptions. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, you have ideas like uh, William Nordhaus's Carbon Club, and it, uh, the economists who really popularized the term, which would re require members of the club to agree to a common price, but then the enforcement mechanism would be tariffs upon uh, not just energy intensive products and not a border adjustment for the internal tax, but just punitive tariffs upon non-participants in the club. Um, I would not want to take the case of defending that design. In between, you have a lot of <coughs> other arrangements. There's been proposals in the last couple of years to border adjust uh, implicit pricing. I'm a little bit skeptical of that. There's been other proposals to uh, provide some sort of border fee without a corresponding domestic price. Um, I think that could be done if it was done structured carefully. Uh, I like that answer because that's kind of where we are in our conversations. Yeah, Go ahead. well, so, so, yeah. so and, and what's really happening is, you know, there, there's been this perception that the trade rules preclude any sort of measure that has an economic motive, is that particularly if, if you have to invoke, the, the WTO has certain exceptions, including environmental exceptions. So if you violate a rule, it, the measure mil, may still be permissible if you can show that it falls within <clears throat> one of these exceptions. And there's been a lot of discussion over the years about the scope of the environmental exceptions. There, there's a widespread perception that any hint of, of economic motive is disqualifying. That's really not true. I mean, what, what major policy decision by a government ever, was ever made without any regard to the impact upon domestic production or employment? It, it just, the world does not work that way. Uh, you do have to show that it makes a legitimate contribution to your environmental objective. So uh, I do think you could structure a border fee regime. Um, if it is environmentally effective and you can show that you're driving down consumption-based uh, emissions, uh, and the fact that it may provide some economic benefit too, that's not disqualifying. Um, beyond the environmental exceptions, there's also a, a uh, uh, frequently overlooked provision that provides exceptions for what are called intergovernmental commodity agreements, which were much more common uh, around the middle, really, of the 20th century. But essentially, this is a, uh, it, they were baked into the fundamental apparatus of the, of the GATT, the predecessor of the WTO, and they allow to, uh, countries to enter into international arrangements to pursue environmental objectives, but also to deal with issues like uh, disequilibrium between production and consumption and wide fluctuations in prices, which pretty much describes our uh, steel markets for the last decade or so. Um, so I, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity to construct something that's going to be permissible within the WTO. Um, Currently, we don't have a functioning WTO dispute settlement system. So to some extent, uh, it, it's not entirely academic, but uh, really what's needed is a plausible theory of WTO compliance. Uh, the EU has been consistent that uh, it thinks the CBAM is WTO consistent, and I think it would be challenging to get them to sign on to any sort of carbon club arrangement unless uh, 
there is um, a, a coherent theory of WTO consistency. Now, thank you. Uh, Michael, any thoughts on that? No, I think, Matt. Is there a consensus there? You concur? Pretty much, yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. And I think it is a matter of design. You know, it's true. There's so many levers in the design of border adjustments on the scope, on the, on the you know, emission scope, country scope, um, mm -hmm. how you credit foreign policies, how you determine the better. So there's, there's many ways to make it more arbitrary and, and potentially more discriminatory and ways to make it more transparent. So of course design and implementation matter, but in mm -hmm. principle, absolutely, as, as Matt put it. That's great, thank you. Now, Sarah, I know you've got thoughts on this, but, 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 uh, but the, the question I also have for you is that you, you've got, you've done a lot of work <coughs> in the industrial security space, Silverado has, right, and supply chain issues, critical minerals, you know, the, you know some of the more important you know, economic issues that we're facing today. Uh, how do you see this climate and trade piece fitting in that broader U.S. industrial security policy? You know, how does it strengthen it? Okay. But yeah, but first, please, uh, please give us your thoughts on WTO compatibility. Well, I, I largely agree with, with Matt. Um, and I and I really like Matt's ideas on on the intergovernmental uh, commodity agreements. I think that there's uh, some 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 real novelty there that should definitely be explored. I mean, at the end of the day, we spend a lot of years um, thinking about how we can craft policies to ensure that we're not sued at the WTO, or that if we are sued, that we are minimizing. Uh, you know the 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 likelihood of of damages or uh, tariffs that we would, suspension of tariff benefits that we would face. At the end of the day, I think we are in a new day on on this. And while we still have the existing agreements as they are and the jurisprudence as it is, um, we have an evolving global consciousness on this issue. And you know, I'd like to believe that. There is enough latitude within the agreements, and uh, you know, with with members of the WTO that would want to move forward, that we could, as the other panelists have noted, you know, design this to you know live within those rules, but maybe to have an interpretation of those rules that really lends itself to sort of the modern day challenges that we're facing on climate and the urgency of those. So. That's what I'll say on that for for the moment. Um, I think that you know on your on your second question, um, this really kind of gets to the heart of the geopolitical issues that you were talking about, Dave. And it is so important. Um, we have you know really offshored and and outsourced and eroded our manufacturing base over time, and we've left a lot of that. Uh, in the hands of countries that don't have the same environmental standards that we do. Uh, so where we find ourselves, not in all cases, but in, in, in a number of cases, is being at a cost disadvantage when it comes to manufacturing, but yet being more carbon efficient. And so when I think about industrial security uh, in this particular sector, I think about what are the sort of types of domestic and international policies that we need to bring some of that manufacturing back home or to friend shore or ally shore, however, you know, the flavor of the day is, and there's lots of, lots of terms that are being thrown around out there. Um, but I think that the reason why is because there's a recognition that we can't bring everything back to the United States. And so where else can we go? But we've got to square this this uh, this this circle, and and I am optimistic. Um, I think you know what we've seen in in the last year or so coming out of this administration, uh, as well as our Congress, is a doubling down on. Uh, you know, our domestic policies and, and investments. And whether you agree with that or not, or you want to call it a subsidy or not, the reality is um, this is a recognition by our government, by two branches of our government, that, you know, we were falling behind and that we needed to do something to shore up our domestic policies. So, okay, that's that's fine, but 
how can we now use trade policies to protect those investments, to drive exports, to drive jobs? Um, I think on the one hand, um, we can use trade policy to create export markets for these new goods that we are going to be producing at home or for the goods that we're already producing here. So whether it's low carbon steel or, you know, we have, uh, you know, uh, use this, the, the, the new money to incentivize even further innovations, we've got to create export markets. We've got to, you know, actually land these products. And so that's where trade policy can really uh, play a role. Secondly, um, you know, trade policies like carbon border adjustments or, or carbon clubs or, or other mechanisms like we've talked about today can be really important in closing the carbon leakage loopholes that have led to the offshoring in the first place. And, you know, if we can do those two things, you know, protect our investments, create export markets for, for U.S. and allied made goods, to, to close these carbon loopholes, then we're talking about an industrial security strategy that not only facilitates decarbonization, but it also creates economic growth here and with allies, and it, it, it creates jobs. So I think, you know, I think that we've got to be, you know, really clear eyed that we've got some powerful tools at our disposal. You mentioned critical uh, materials. I know we're coming at a time. This is such an important piece of the equation. Um, we are very import reliant on many of the critical minerals that we need in order to support our clean technology transition. And we have got to use trade policy tools to also help incentivize a diversification, especially where we are super reliant on a single source like China for much of our, for example, processing. Oh, that's terrific. And as you say, climate and trade policy can be used uh, <clears throat> to, help, to help sort of rectify that and to help ad address that challenge. Well, I just want to, so I want to thank everyone, uh, all of our panelists, you guys, you guys were uh, terrific as, as was expected and anticipated. Um, so very, very happy and, and uh, I owe you uh, grub and drinks or whatever, wh whatever we can. But I'm going to hand it over to Jennifer now to, uh, to uh, show us all off. Well, thank you so much, and thank you again to our audience for tuning in at home. Please, please read the report. It's really, really fantastic. And again, thank you to our speakers, to Dave for this fabulous panel. Thank you again, Dave Banks, Michael Melling, Matt Porterfield, Sarah Stewart, and Aaron Weston. And from the Atlantic Council, I would also like to thank Amaya Hadup, Laura Macedo, Jasper Gilardi, Eamon Coughlin, and Linwood Turner. So thank you again, um, everyone, and I look forward to seeing you all again soon.